But as to today's gathering, as many of you are aware, the name of the Institute is the Hale Institute, and it recalls the life and service of Sir Matthew Hale, who is a jurist of renown in England in the common law system and who lived and served during the very turbulent 17th century in England. And in view of the Institute's name and further its mission that includes among its several goals an advance and understanding of our common law legal heritage. We deemed it fitting um, that for our first, our launching conference, we should give attention to the common law itself. What is it? What is its importance? What are its characteristics and virtues? How and what has it contributed to the American legal system? And why might the Institute have selected it for particular emphasis? We have two exceptional scholars with us today to address these and other matters. But before um, introducing them and inviting their contributions, um, I'm going to offer some comments by way of a brief preamble. Uh, those of you who were present here yesterday afternoon for a disputatio lecture on the revolutionary disposition of our age, or who otherwise have been paying attention to what the law has been dealing us over the last number of years, um, may recognize the distinguishing feature of our contemporary moment in its character of radical negation. It promotes the cause of putative justice in terms of an overthrow of our received standards, institutions, beliefs, and constraints that are embedded in the historic community and legal orders. Now, these modern levelers demand immediate amelioration of an array of circumstances that they deem intolerable. This intolerability of our present conditions justifies their impunity in assailing law, decorum, institutions, and community mores. They assure us that they know the path to justice because they've worked it out in theory and are anxious to impose its terms now, notwithstanding their demanded alternatives have been to this point unknown to our civilization. This kind of outlook and comportment is the antithesis of the common law mind, which by contrast is patient, cautious, constitutionally respectful of tradition, deferring to wisdom resident in community custom, and honoring the rule of law over against the claim prerogatives of power and the designs of so-called experts and other discoverers of novelties that we must hastily implement. The 17th century had its prominent challengers to received wisdom as well. Sir Francis Bacon and Thomas Hobbes devoted themselves to reworking such foundational considerations as the meaning of nature and human nature. In so doing, and here I paraphrase one of Professor Stoner's former colleagues, Ella Sandoz, they were launching a sustained attack on the tradition of thought exemplified by Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, and Richard Hooker. <coughs> Bacon and Hobbes also represented the challenge to the ideas of the common law jurists, including notably Lord Hale. Hale authored a reproof of Hobbes' manuscript critiquing the common law. And in it, Hale argues, among other things, that the legal system is not and cannot be the from scratch product of abstract philosophical reflection and construction. And in a representative passage in this critique, Hale wrote the following. It is a reason for me to prefer a law by which a kingdom has been happily governed four or 500 years than to adventure the happiness and peace of a kingdom upon some new theory of my own, though I am better acquainted with the reasonableness of my own theory than with the law. Again, I have reason to assure myself that long experience makes more discoveries touching the conveniences or inconveniences of laws than is possible for the wisest counsel of men at first to foresee." End quote. This is a, a display of the defining temperament of the common law. It is an historically aware and realistic sensibility. Consider, from the individual philosopher's position, who through his brief and isolated life experience has had access to an infinitesimally small and unrepresentative sum of history, how does such an individual design a system with form and substance that plausibly comprehends the whole of the community and whose trajectory his ideas would claim to reliably direct? 
A legal system is a complexity composed and characterized by an immensity of responses to an uncountable number of particulars worked out in community and settled into custom over the course of generations, of centuries. We may recall with sympathy Edmund Burke shuddering upon viewing the French Revolution and its overthrow of the Ancien Regime, announcing the claim to start the whole world anew. The very idea of the fabrication of a new government, Burke wrote as an Englishman, is enough to fill us with disgust and horror. In his discussion of the English common law liberties, Burke continuously describes them as ancient and always in terms such as these, an inheritance from our forefathers, a patrimony, a hereditary title. That is, as accomplishments handed down as gifts, obliging their recipients to a continuing responsibility of preservation and transmission themselves. But our contemporary upheavalists have little sympathy with this conservative approach, with its posture of humility and gratitude and emerging as it is from a theological and philosophical framework that they renounce. Our modern proponents of progress through unprecedented novelty, yet who wish to have continuing access to the array of virtues, centuries in the making, that our yet stable legal system offers, fail to acknowledge that the remarkable structure and content of our law are cultural achievements. As such, they're dependent on a careful continuation of foundational and interrelating premises and practices. These are not conditions that can be commanded and fetched in an instant simply by a choice, a vote, or a regulatory imposition. They are not things to be knocked down or picked up according to a moment's wish. The late Sir Roger Scruton, in once observing that historic institutions aren't the sorts of things that can be destroyed and then recreated at will, invoked Wittgenstein to the effect that reviving a tradition is like trying to repair a spider's web with your bare hands. Be careful what you trifle with. Yet lamentably, our contemporaries often don't pause to entertain such concerns. After all of the old days, that is, the aggregated community investment of fidelity and virtue put in through the centuries to build an impressive legal and social order. These come lately beneficiaries of all of this lose sight of those old standards to which our manifold comforts are indebted. Many are they now who in large part think, for instance, that the rule of law in its many facets and implications simply sprang up out of the ground and it will always remain on these shores like the air we breathe, independent of any continuing beliefs, commitments, or investments by us. Jacques Barzun once wrote about this form of thinking as follows, quote, in a high civilization, the things that satisfy our innumerable desires look as if they were supplied automatically so that nothing is owed to particular persons. Goods belong by congenital right to anybody who takes the trouble to be born. This, he writes, is the infant's normal greed prolonged into adult life and headed for retribution. When sufficiently general, the habit of grabbing, cheating, and evading reciprocity is the best way to degrade a civilization and perhaps bring about its collapse." End quote. Ortega y Gasset makes um, a similar point in his book, Revolt of the Masses, in observing that this new dominant type of man is a primitive one who likes his painkillers and motor cars but cares not a whit for civilization and the hard-fought, long-slog institutionalizing of achieved wisdom and precept that facilitate peaceful and fruitfully cooperative conditions. This neglect is no way to approach the inheritances of social order and legal structures. We are beneficiaries with fiduciary responsibilities. Our debts to our predecessors are only discharged by preserving, refining, and then bequeathing the gifts we have received to those who come after us. <laughs>